Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation. Uh, my name is Agathe Los Pilo and I will be telling you a little bit about technical animation for game. So to start, a little bit more about CA. Uh, Creative Assembly is the largest UK games developer and one of Europe's leading development studios with 35 years experience and an incredible team of 850 persons. The studio won several awards for our AAA games such as Alien Isolation or the Total War franchise. It also has been elected best place to work uh, since 2017, so six years in a row. If you are interested in joining us, uh, we currently have something like 70 open positions, I think. Know a little bit more about me. Uh, I am 31 years old, as you can hear, I'm French, uh, and I'm a senior technical animator for Creative Assembly. I joined the studio four years and a half ago, and I loved it since. Uh, I'm also an ambassador and part of the Legacy Project, which goal is to promote diversity and in in inclusion in the game industry as much as for our players. We are aiming for an industry which would be as inclusive, diverse and respectful for everyone as can be, where everyone would be welcome exactly as they are and where our differences can finally be seen as an opportunity and a chance. We also want to make games which are adapted to all players, whoever they are, whatever the specific needs are. It is a long but very exciting journey. When I'm not working for Creative Assembly, I am also a sailor on the French historical boat, the Hermione. Uh, she's a reconstitution of a 18th century frigate. And it's obviously the most beautiful boat in the world. What can I say? Uh, I'm also a very proud kitty mum. Uh, if you have any question about my cat, please feel free to reach. How did I get there? Um, as far as I can recall, I've always been drawing. Uh, I've always loved that. And I wanted to work in the art industry. My parents wanted me to have a job. So, you know, we find a compromise between art and eating and paying rent. Uh, that led me to a French VFX school named Superfocum where I spent five years from 2008 to 2013. Uh, after getting my diploma, I worked for five years on different VFX TV series in different countries, uh, such as uh, French, France, sorry, uh, Ireland or Singapore. And in 2018, CA gave me the opportunity to join the game industry. I was very curious to see what were the differences between the VFX industry and the game industry what were the different constraints, the pipeline. Uh, I was really eager to try something new and I'm really not disappointed I did. Since I joined CA, I worked on very cool games from the Total War franchise, uh, such as uh, Three Kingdoms, which is a historical title about a three parties Chinese war in the, in the third century. Uh, I worked on uh, DLCs for Warmer 2. I worked on the main game, uh, Warmer 3, and currently we're working on the Warmer 3 DLCs. It is really nice to get to work on such different projects because uh, the historical ones, such as Three Kingdoms, are a great opportunity to get to learn a lot more about some very specific time in history that, uh, that I wouldn't even know about if I wasn't working on that topic. Uh, and working on games like Warmer is just a lot of fun. It's it's really wonderful to see how creative the artist can be and how biased the character I have to work with are. Uh, we are also currently working on other games that I am not allowed to tell you about, so please stay tuned because I am very excited about uh, what we have to come and I cannot wait for you to hear about that. What are we here for, right? Technical animation, what is that? Uh, a technical animator will have, I would say, uh, two main missions, right? Uh, the first one will be to rig and skin uh, characters. And I will go back exactly on the meaning and the process of that later. Uh, so that's the first task. And the second task would be to create uh, tools for the animators to make their life as simple as possible uh, and to leave them 
as much time as possible to focus on the artistic part of animation more than the technical part. So that so then they can really bring life to characters as freely as possible. Um, to do so, we also create tools uh, for ourselves to help with the process. Um, doing so, I work with several teams. The first team I work with is the concept art team. Uh, the concept artists are the ones who are creating what the unit will look like. Uh, it will be characters, it can be props, it can be engines, it can be vehicles, anything. Uh, they will uh, research references of what it looks like, uh, they will think about the mechanism involved, they will uh, research the cultural references, the materials they want to, the element to look like, um, actors who can inspire the faces, references for everything. Uh, which will then be used by the character artists, who will create the 3D models from the concept art. Uh, they will sculpt the mesh, they will paint the texture, they will assign the materials, so we have something which looks like what the concept artists thought about. Uh, I also work with the game designers. Game designers would be the one who say how it is supposed to behave in game. Uh, the one they are the ones saying, um, well, you know, this character is uh, very childish and it won't run very fast, but it will have a strong melee attack something like that. Uh, they are the one creating the balance of the units and they are mostly the one dealing uh, with the database to pull, to pull all those information in game. I also work a lot uh, with the animation team uh, who are the one using the assets we create to bring them to life. Basically, if you think of a game as a puppet show, it would go something like that. Concept art will be the one saying, okay, I want this puppet to look like, for example, a Chinese girl with two hairbands and a massive gun, right? Character art will sculpt and paint the puppet so it looks like a Chinese girl with two hairbands, a skirt and a massive gun. Game design will say, okay, so this is a distance unit uh, they will, you know, shoot from afar and won't be very good in close combat, something like that. This is how they are supposed to behave. Uh, technical animation will be the one creating the articulations, the strings, the controllers to make the puppet move. Uh, and the animators will be the one moving the puppet, right? Creating the show, basically. Uh, using the information game design gave them. Back to our subject. Let's talk about rigging, shall we? Here are the main elements of a rig. On the left, you have the mesh, which is what which is what we receive from the character artists. Here, it is supposed to be pretty, but we will get it in what we call an A pose, and we will see one later. In the middle, you can see the skeleton. It's made with the specific object we can uh, we call bones or joints and basically everything which needs to move needs a joint it doesn't have to be a bone like in the human body right uh, in this skeleton for example uh, you have joints for the skirt but uh, on other models you can have joints for uh, specific muscles uh, for the hair for wings Everything which needs to move needs a joint. Uh, and then on the right, you have the controllers. This is what the animators are working with. And we want something which is as clear as possible for them. So usually you will have a color code saying here, for example, yellow is in the middle, blue is on the right, red is on the left. So they know easily what they are working with. Um, I will show you that later, but we will also use layers uh, so they can select if they are working with the main controllers, if they are working with just a face, if they are working with the secondary controllers, uh, which will most of the time be closes, 
hair, these kind of things. Uh, so yeah, so we can clip keep. So we can keep the skeleton uh, and the rig as clear as possible for them. When given a new character, what happens? For example, uh, I received this. Okay, uh, that's that's an A pose, uh, by the way. Uh, as I was uh, talking about earlier, you can see the the arms are spread from the body, so we don't have any collision on the armpit. But we also avo avoid the strong shape the shoulder can have when they have a T pose. You know, there is a strong angle here. Uh, I will show you it. T pose uh, later. I received this. Who is she? Uh, so design, give me details about the character, right? Uh, so her name is Isle. She is part of the Wooden Elf faction, and she is one of the most powerful wizards in all of the woods. She's a semi goddess of nature. She commands the tree of the forest to, to grow and vegetation to spring forth from the ground. The pattern of her wings can sometimes display the marking of the death head's mouth to indicate she's enraged and in a vengeful, mo vengeful mood. Sounds pretty epic to me. So she's half human, half mouth. So I will need joints for the human body. Arms, legs, the usual, spine. Okay. I will use I will need joints uh, for the wings, for the dress, for the sleeve because they are pretty long and can stay rigid. Uh, I will ha need a joint for the antennas we have here. Hair too, I think, as they are pretty massive. Perfect. Uh, then I put every joint uh, where I want it to be. Uh, I've done rigging for 10 years now, so I know more or less how the human body is made. Uh, and if I have a doubt, I mean, it's pretty easy to uh, to quickly check on myself well, where the clav is attached. Uh, I remember the ankles are way higher than I always think. Um, and that's it. Skeleton. The way you will place uh, your pivots is essential, and I cannot stress enough how a good knowledge of anatomy or looking at references is important. Uh, I keep learning every day on those topics. Uh, recently at CA we had a talk from uh, Stuart Sumida about uh, animal anatomy, and it was mind-blowing, really. Uh, so don't be afraid to spend time looking for references. Plus, it's sometimes... Uh, a nice break to spend half an hour on YouTube looking at clients and bears, you know, in a professional way. That's nice. So, our skeleton is done. We will no skin the mesh to it. For that, um, I will paint weight on the mesh to indicate which parts need to follow which joint. Uh, we want to preserve volumes but also avoid collisions. We want to preserve the feeling of something solid with muscle and a mass and still avoid the lower leg to collide into the upper leg. It is about balance and once again you never have enough uh, references. And you don't want to be afraid to preserve angles. Trust me. An elbow, a knee, that's not round. There is a bone inside. This is, you know, hard. If you have ever been nudged in the public transport, you know what I'm talking about. Angles. Uh, here you can see I added a joint for the sleeve, uh, so it doesn't stay rigid, and animators can then create nice movement when she moves the arms. Um, interesting detail. Uh, this is actually an exception on the way we are creating hands. Uh, most of the time, as we are working on a game with a lot of units fighting each other and a lot of characters in each unit, we try to be as efficient as possible and to go straight to the point with joints. Uh, this one is an exception. 
right? Uh, she's a legendary hero, she's a semi-goddess, she's like huge, like four meters high, so we need details. But most of the time, our character will only have three fingers right, like thumb, index, and the rest of the hand, like mitten to save joints. Um, that's doing that always save uh, 12 joints, and sometimes it is about the 12 joints you are saving. Now, to the rigging tool. Uh, you can see every joint is named in a specific way, following a naming convention, which is the same for all characters. Um, you'll understand later uh, why this is important when we will get to tools. Uh, it's also where we will assign uh, mirror joints, so animators can mirror pose from a side to the other one, saving a lot of time. Uh, that's actually a very good uh, example of a tool which has been developed by technical animators for technical animators. So here we are, building the rig through the tool. As you can see, same color code than earlier, yellow in the middle, blue on the right, red on the left, so it's easy for animators to approach it. Then here you can see the character being animated. Right, so everything that you can see moving has been rigged and skinned. You can see the skeleton, you can see the controllers that the, the animators used, uh, and you can see that I created different layers uh, for the main rig, the secondary controllers, the wings, the skirt, so animator can really choose to show only what they are focusing on. Um, the important thing for us is to have uh, characters as functional and as clear as possible for them to play with, basically. That's another very cool character we have here. Um, it is called the Stonehorn from the Ogre faction. Um, once again, design gives us a little bit info about them. Uh, they are massive, horned, woolly beasts from the mountains of Morn that the Ogres tame and use in battle. They are massive beasts of muscle, violence and stupidity. They are quite literally living fossils, their skeleton hardened by the same rock as the mountains where they live. Their charge is a deadly combination of weight, momentum and bad temper. Again, a lot of fun. Yeah, that's the info we get from design, so we know we have a good idea of the character we are working with. Um, another interesting fact here, uh, this is actually a proxy. Uh, very often, we will work with a proxy, so a low version, uh, a low poly version of the character. Uh, they are faster to create from uh, for art, and they allow us an animation to start earlier to work with the character. Uh, they are also often easier to skin uh, because they have less details, so I generally use them as a base to skin. So the interesting question was, uh, as this is obviously less human-related than the previous one, uh, what can I use as a reference for it, right? This one is pretty easy. I will go with an elephant. So I will need joints for uh, details, because it has a long tail, and I will need joints for whatever is happening up there. You probably, you probably already know about that, but here comes an, anatom an anatomy point. Uh, elephant, like a lot of quadrupeds, are young late, uh, meaning they walk on their toes, like cats and dog. So if you look at the leg, it goes hip, knee, ankle, toes. Um, here there is an extra one because I needed a claw inside the foot, but they are walking on their toes. Another quick thing about this skeleton is, uh, for example, when you're building a tail, you want the upper part uh, joints to be longer than the lower part ones, uh, because the end of the tail is more flexible, so it needs more definition, um, as it's thinner. Funny enough, you can actually see the same thing with your own limbs, right? Uh, for example, arm, upper arm is longer than the lower arm, which is longer than the hand, and uh, even your phalanges uh, are getting shorter and shorter to be more uh, flexible, more precise. Uh, back to it. So here I'm building the rig, using the rigging tool, 
And once again, you can see that everything is symmetrical, color code is the same, and you can see that I have uh, different layers for the different level of details the animators could want, and to not be confused by the crazy amount of controllers in the scene. Here there is only one character, but uh, animators sometimes work with the scenes where there, are, there is four or five of, of them. You want to be really organized uh, about the file uh, you give them. And here is the big boy animated. So now you can see that this is the final mesh. You can notice that there is a lot of lot more uh, definition, a lot more details uh, on the main, on the things happening in his back, and uh, how cool this animation is. So you remember earlier I was talking about concept, right? So here you have the first thing we will receive when approaching a new character. Design, concept art and art and technical uh, animation will go together to talk about it uh, and get to know exactly what we need for it, right? So design will give us info. This is a plague toad. It's a putrid demon puss beast covered with filth. It's the lowest of Nogal's creatures and is able to eat a man alive in a heartbeat. Nice! What do we do from that? Concept Art created the Plague Toad. You can see some picture references for the tongue, the horns, the eyes, the skin. So character artists will know what to do and what type of details we want for it. And this is what we get from technical from uh, artists, right? A disgusting but amazing Plague Toad. So this is exactly what I receive. What will I do with that? Once again, I will look for references because from the top of my head, really, I have no idea how to do that, right? I mean, I cannot remember when was the last time I saw a frog. So I will do some research. I will grab a skeleton. I will grab um, how the muscles are built on the body. I will grab anything which helps me to understand uh, the anatomy of the character. Where are the main muscles? Uh, what are the strong limbs? Um, these kind of things. And I will look with animation for movement references so we know how we want uh, how we want it to behave. Uh, we know how it moves, we know how it breathes, uh, how it uh, jumps, how it will uh, attack with the tongue, everything which can be useful in creating a living, alive character. From there, I will think about uh, how we can bring that to game, right? Um, how do we give the possibility for animators to reproduce those movements? If you look at the breathing toad, you can see how the back and the goiter move. If you look at the skeleton, obviously there is no bone in there. So how do I mimic the movement of the muscles? This is the moment where, okay, we get it. Anatomy is important, but we are making games, right? Not biology lessons. So once you know how it works in real life, once you understand how it behaves, you can find ways to cheat, to reproduce it. The point of it is to be believable when you see it, not to make every scientist who studied toad's anatomy and behavior for 10 years to believe it's an actual real toad, right? So here what I, what I did was uh, adding a rotation joint from the spine to inflate the belly and the back when the toad breathe. The important thing was uh, to have the pivot in the right place to allow the, the belly blowing up while respecting the global shape of the model. And this is how we get to this amazing jumping, attacking toad. Once you know 
that the anatomy is globally correct, that it's uh, tangible, you can be creative uh, to make it more expressive and to uh, meet the animator's needs. So that was the rigging and skinning part. Uh, so that was, if you remember, the first task of the technical animators. The second one was to create tools. How do we do that? Um, usually, animation would come to us saying, hey, it would be real cool if we were able to do something like that, or um, I am losing a lot of time doing this myself. Is there any way to uh, automatize uh, that? And we will see how we can help. Uh, we will also sometimes uh, take some uh, some time to talk with them about their working process and see if something uh, can be done to help them on our way. Uh, and a lot of the ideas for uh, tools will also come from informal chats, right? Such as uh, tea breaks or lunch time, uh, when everyone can just randomly dwell on any issue they are uh, experiencing right now, as it sometimes uh, it sometimes can be hard for animators to know exactly what type of tools we can provide, um, especially for new members of the team or for the ones who are here for so long they they are used to a mindset or to a workflow and don't really give themselves the opportunity to think about new tools. Thinking about new tools is really something uh, which which not which is not always easy you also also have to be really creative on the on what you can bring on the technical side so this one for example uh, is a tool for animators it will allow allow them to use the feature of the rig as easily as possible it will bring different type of things right uh, for example uh, this part allows you to switch from IK to FK without losing the pose, and it can be animated. Uh, FK is uh, for uh, forward kinematic. This is when the upper part of the limb drives the lower one, and IK is for inverse kinematic. Uh, it is when the lower part of the limb is constrained. Uh, for example, if you're walking, your foot is on the floor, and it constrains the movement of your whole body, specifically the leg, uh, but when you're sitting with your with your legs dangling, moving your thighs will move your foot. Same with arms. If you are holding something fixed, you can uh, move the elbow, but not the arm, but not the hand. Sorry. Uh, this is something which is pretty useful uh, to be able to do. This is also where we would have our uh, weapon system. Uh, in a rig, the way we create and build it, the weapons aren't parented to the hand, they are constrained. Uh, that means that we can animate those constraints. We will create presets, saying, for example, this sword is attached to the right hand when it's armed and to the left hip when it's docked. Uh, the shield is attached to the left arm when uh, when it's armed and to the back when it's docked. Uh, the spear is held in two hands, but the main one is the right one and the left hand will be constrained to the spear itself and when it's docked, it goes to the back. An arrow will be either in the right hand when you're uh, aiming or in the quiver. A bow will be in the left hand or on the back, and so on. So you can arm the weapon, or you can dock it, depending if the character is actually uh, using the weapon to attack, or if he's running, so he would prefer to have his shield in the back, because, let's face it, no one wants to run with a shield on the arm, right? This is way too heavy. You also can detach the weapon from the character, for, for example, when he dies, Usually you drop your weapon when you die. Uh, or uh, when you're uh, shooting or throwing things, right? Uh, a 
throwing knife or an arrow will be constrained to the hand until you are letting it go, throwing it, and then it's not constrained anymore. Animating constraint. Useful. The other way to do that would be to align the prop frame by frame, but let's face it, no one wants to do that, so allowing the animating constraint is way easier. This is uh, another very cool tool, which is called the Retargeter. It will allow uh, the animators to reuse an animation from a skeleton to another one. This is one of the reasons why the naming convention is strict, right? It is way easier to do to retarget when you just say past animation from clav left to clav left and not Okay, so I think in this skeleton I'm named the clav clav zero one and in this one it was clavicle left zero one. Uh, so I need to go through the list of all joint to select them and associate them and no naming convention if the characters are very different that's okay too you can retarget part of the character only like from a human to a centaur for example you could re you could retarget just the upper part and retarget the lower part from a, from a horse and that's it you have a centaur running and attacking Perfect. Uh, this is also how we use uh, motion capture. Animators will go to the motion capture studio, do crazy acting in pretty black suits, and will use those uh, to create a rough animation. They can then polish and time properly. They will use that uh, as a base for their uh, final animation. Then, we talked about it earlier, right? But what would be a technical animator? without the rigging tool. It will allow us to create uh, rigs, obviously, and uh, for that uh, to create chains of joints uh, that we can choose to be IK, FK, IK spline. Uh, it will allow us to mirror part of our rig, it will allow us to create a constraint it will allow us to set behavior to a joint related to another joint. This is something we will use a lot when it comes to um, mechanical characters. For example, the old constraint thing. Uh, we will use it for weapons, as we talked about it earlier. But uh, it w we will also use it uh, for, uh, for mechanical characters, for things like uh, pistons, things like that, automatism. Uh, which exists in the in the mechanical behavior. It will also allow us to register a skinning pose, which is the A pose we receive, uh, in which we receive the character. Uh, it will, but it will also allow us to uh, save another pose, the T pose, uh, which is the one we will use to rig to build the rig. We are building the rig in the T pose, uh, so we can have some nice straight limbs, so our IK are built in one single axe to have something really clean. Uh, it allows us to create uh, controllers, it checks if there is any issue with what we've done, really. This is the place where everything happens. So, now that we've been through the different tasks, uh, of a, of a technical animator. What would I need to be a good technical animator? First thing first, we will need some strong technical knowledge, right? Uh, it is obvious, but we will need technical knowledge of uh, 3D software, such as, the, such as uh, Maya, 3ds Max, or Blender. Once you get the logic of one, it's pretty easy to jump to another one. Um, I had a teacher who used to compare 3D software to houses. Uh, once you get to learn the logic of one, uh, you might not get exactly where, where is the kitchen the minute you enter the house, but you will know that 
it's more or less where you would go to look for a spoon, right? Logic is more or less the same, the same once you get the specificity of the software. Uh, for example, I personally learned uh, 3ds Max at school, and it took me few months to get used to Maya, and no, I really don't want to switch back. Um, you will also need some uh, game engine knowledge, uh, such as uh, Unity or Unreal. Um, those are always useful if you want to work in video game to understand the full pipeline. Um, and as we are also developing tool, uh, you will need some coding skills. Um, we mostly use Python, so that's uh, also some important knowledge to get. Apart from technical skills, you will need uh, flexibility. Uh, obviously, each studio has its uh, own way to deal with different projects at the same time. Uh, but for example, at CA, there is only one technical animation team for all Total War projects. It means that currently, the six of us are working on three different projects at the same time, depending on uh, what each on, which one of them needs. It is really nice because uh, if you happen to get bored of one project, you easily can, uh, you know, have some feel like something new, something more exciting by switching to a different project. But it also means mean that you are working with different teams, different people, different workflow, different uh, specificities. So you need to be able to adapt to the project and to the people you are working with. You will need some rigor. Uh, as I showed you, you have we have a strict naming convention, but it's not the only uh, strict convention we have. Uh, from parenting to setting info into the database, there is a lot of things which need to be done the right way to not crash the game. Uh, Honestly, my screen is covered with sticky notes to be sure I don't forget anything and I still check everything several times before submitting anything to game because, trust me, you don't want to be the reason why no one can access the game for half a day. We mentioned it, you need to understand anatomy. Uh, what makes what make, uh, something look right, what makes it look broken, where you need to be accurate to keep something believable, where you can get creative. Anatomy is a pretty strong thing to get. Last but not least, uh, you will need communication skills. That might be obvious. I've mentioned several times you were working with different team. Uh, each team will have different needs, specific habits, specific workflow. It is related to flexibility, right? But you also want to be sure to understand the team needs and to be able to communicate uh, your needs and your limits. You want to be able to communicate in an efficient way with everyone to be able to work in the best way possible. That's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I hope it was interesting. Uh, I hope you get uh, something from this. Thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day.